a crowded night. If any of you came from town or from the village, <laughs> if we brought all those people in here tonight, we wouldn't have room for them all. Um, very crowded. Kind of a fun night, but uh, we're going to have a good night here too. I appreciated last night hearing the names George Blaurock and Felix Mons and Michael Sattler again. When I was in high school, a woman by the name of Margaret Foth, who turned out to be a pretty good writer for our Mennonite magazines later on, put a screen, well, I'd call it a screenplay, put a play together based on Myron Augsburger's book, Pilgrim of Flame, and she recruited a bunch of us in western New York to be actors in this play. And I was one of them, and we went through that and went through that and went through that and had multiple performances and ended up in Harrisonburg, Virginia for the final set of performances because Myron Augsburger, who had written the book, got wind of this production and said, come on down here and put it on at the college. So we went down there and I played the part of Felix Mons. My dad was Ulrich Zwingli and then the other characters. And it's interesting, even last night this happened, uh, George Blaurock especially, I think looked exactly like the guy who played him in this uh, play that we did. It's just the image that we have in our minds. Uh, but what I remember, uh, my parents were there, and I went up to stand beside him. They were talking to Myron Augsburger. They knew him. And he looked at me, and he said, Felix, put his hand out and shook my hand. Good job. And uh, oh, wow. <laughs> my 15 minutes of fame was right there. But really what I remember about that is how often when those names come up, I know exactly what they're talking about. And when Dan was saying how George Blaurock was baptized first, and then he baptized everybody else, that all came back. And then a couple years later, in between my uh, freshman first and second semester at Heston, I had a chance to take an Anabaptist history tour overseas. It's the only time I've been overseas in my life. Uh, went to Europe and went on this tour and saw all these places and saw the river, the Lamont River, where Felix Mons was drowned, right at the spot even. Got a picture of it. So uh, just all of this history, just a reminder, this stuff really happened. And it was 500 years ago, but how much it's formed us today, and I'm just glad that, uh, that Dan is here uh, to bring this back to us and, and to look for the meaning behind that. So. So you, brought, you made me feel young again last night, Dan. That doesn't happen too often, so thank you for that. Lois is our singer tonight, our song leader tonight. She's got a couple songs for us, and then uh, Evan will come up. The Red Book. 554.
Good to see you all here this evening, particularly Dan. So. <laughs> um, for those of you who may not have been here last night, this is our third session in the Legacy 500. Started about four years ago. We had two sessions and then COVID hit and we took a recess for a while. And this is our first one back. And uh, certainly glad for you all to be here to share in this. Um, for those of you who don't know Dan, uh, probably the best place to start is that he's a past president of Rosedale Bible College. He was there for eight years. Before that, he, was, uh, he and his wife were executive directors at Spruce Lake Retreat, uh, camp, Christian camp of the Franconia Conference in the Poconos. Uh, after Rosedale, they went to Haiti for about five years working with a, a uh, mission agency there and are presently in Minnesota uh, directing a, a camp, a Christian camp there. And uh, I think it's what, eight years you've been there, Dan? Seven years? Uh, I'll let Dan fill in other details that he might want to. Dan has been speaking about the Anabaptist approach to scripture. And uh, I, I think this is extremely significant because the glasses we use to look at the Bible determines where we come out on the other side. And uh, I'm convinced that the Anabaptists got it right. And, uh, and they were also very concerned about trying to emulate the early church. And uh, I think they got it kind of straight from the horse's mouth in a lot of ways. So Dan has been sharing with us. Uh, he's been talking about a three-legged stool. He gave us one leg last night, and tonight's another leg. You might want to fill him in on the first leg there, Dan. So. And then uh, tomorrow night, probably the third leg. All righty. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for Dan's willingness, and Wendy also, to come here to share with us. I want to thank you for the gifting that you have given them. I want you, thank you for Dan's desire to seek you and to understand you in the best way possible. I thank you for the hard work and study that he's put into this and uh, thank you for what you've revealed to him. I just pray that you will anoint him this evening and, and bless him as he shares with us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dan? There we go. Hello, everyone. Well, it's good to see you. I was quite the gauntlet to get out here this evening, dodging little... <laughs> pumpkins and witches and <laughs> all of that, but we made it uh, safely. It was hard to see them. There was a lot of, lot of activity in town there. Well, it is so nice to be here. We had a lovely day. We spent a good part of the day out at the farm. Uh, Rosanna was hosting us along with some other friends and volunteers out there. What a, what a beautiful resource you have as a community. Uh, just a real blessing to have that old uh, Moser farm there as a as a link to history and, and uh, to, to the story of this community. I, we, we really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed our time there. We also enjoyed catching up with old friends, Tim and Lois Hilgis from this community. We're at Spruce Lake with us for uh, a number of years. We kind of had our kids together and raised uh, our families along the way, and it was just really nice to catch up with them uh, this evening. It's nice to be back together with you as well to pick up the story of Anabaptism. Uh, it's also nice to sing out of the old red hymnal. Uh, that, that's still, uh, that's the one that, is, you know, that's the one I cut my teeth on when, I, when we came into the uh, uh, Mennonite faith community. 606 is in the right place in that hymnal, among other things. And uh, so anyway, uh, 
Um, we enjoyed that. Uh, we want to pick up where we left off. I just a, a few of you weren't here yesterday, but the, the, what we talked about yesterday is the idea of the um, the Anabaptist story of as as uh, as not a denomination, not a culture, but as a hermeneutic, a, a way. Anabaptism, I said, is a way of understanding Scripture, and that approach to understanding scripture, that three-legged stool uh, Evan, Evan mentioned, um, leads to some conclusions. And, and the idea is, I think if you could pick up that hermeneutic and move it anywhere in the world, um, you're going to have people coming to a lot of the same conclusions. They might look different in, in terms of the cultural clothing that it, they're dressed in, uh, but, but anybody using this hermeneutic are, are, is going to come to some of the same conclusions. Some of the, uh, of the things that we talked about last night, uh, um, we talked about some of these Mennonite distinctives, non-conformity, non-resistance, uh, um, uh, not swearing of oaths, uh, the, the permanence of marriage, just a lot of the things that we hold to as a faith community are conclusions that come out of our hermeneutic and have come to the other people out of their hermeneutic, including in the 1500s when these uh, folks in, uh, in Switzerland started their journey and then move into Holland and uh, Alsace, France and, and other places along the way where this, uh, this uh, hermeneutic has guided the thinking. And, and I agree with Evan that this hermeneutic, uh, I think if you look back at the teachings of the early church, has been around... Um, for a long time. I think, I think this hermeneutic echoes the hermeneutic that men, many of the early Christian writers, uh, Clement of Alexandria, um, uh, uh, oh, I can't remember all uh, the ones I was thinking of, but, but, uh, but a number of these early Christian writers wrote in such a way that, that when I read them, I see this hermeneutical approach. A hermeneutic is basically a way of understanding and interpreting scripture. It's the, uh, as you said, the glasses or the lenses that you have. We all have the same Bible, but we don't all come to the same Bible the same way. We don't all focus on the same things. We don't all, uh, you know, we, we need the help of the Spirit, first of all, uh, and the Spirit guides us, but what we, we bring to the work of the Spirit also a, uh, a, an approach to understanding scripture. In the Anabaptist uh, community, um, across the board, there is a three-legged approach to understanding Scripture and interpreting Scripture. And uh, the first leg that we had talked about uh, was uh, called Christocentrism. And it's a, an approach to understanding and interpreting Scripture that places Christ at the center and say, says that we are followers of Jesus Christ. We are going to look to Jesus and Jesus is going to help us understand all of the rest of Scripture because Jesus is God incarnate. Jesus is God as God wanted to be known. Jesus is, in, in, in this sense, the fullest revelation of God to us. And Jesus then helps us understand what Scripture is saying, understand uh, what Scripture means, understand how to, how to move in and to the rest of Scripture, both the Old Testament, we see Jesus in the Old Testament, in the prophecies, in, in the types and shadows. We see him in, in, in the, the creation story. Uh, we see Jesus uh, uh, typified in, in Jonah, in, in, the, in um, Moses, in, in, again and again, in, in the serpent lifted up. And, and the Bible uh, and the, the apostles and Jesus, if you look at the New Testament, use this hermeneutic when they approach Scripture. And so in some ways, I make the argument, we're just simply adopting the hermeneutic that Jesus used when he was walking along the road to Emmaus and telling uh, the disciples things from the Old Testament, from the prophet, from prophets, from the law, uh, from, from the Psalms of, that were spoken of um, about him, and, and, and he was finding himself in Scripture, and that's what Christocentrism is. In some ways, it, it put, it, instead of the Word of God and Jesus being here, Jesus is Lord of the Scriptures. The Scriptures are, uh, we believe, inspired. They're authoritative. We have a high view of Scripture. We, we take the Bible you know, at face value as, 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 as something that God has spoken into, God has breathed into this, and we say Jesus is the Lord of the Scripture, and the Scripture is about him. It's his story. It, it paints the picture of Christ. 
And our ultimate goal is to be conformed, as the writer says, to the image and likeness of Christ. And that's the story. That's what this is all about. This was summarized uh, in the 1963 Confession of Faith of the Mennonite Church really well. And I want to put that on the screen. And Ma uh, Mallory, here we go. And uh, I, this is another thing that I cut my teeth on. When I pick up the red hymnal, it, it, it feels warm to me and comfortable. When I pick up the 1963 Mennonite Confession of Faith, that's the confession of faith that, that, that we were uh, taught and, and that we learned as we came into the uh, Mennonite Church. So it's a, it's a familiar document to me. And the 1963 Mennonite Confession of Faith says this. It says, The message of the Bible points to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to him that the scriptures of the Old Testament bear witness. He is the one to whom the scriptures of the New Testament proclaim. He is the key to the proper understanding of the entire Bible. That's what Christocentrism is all about. It's a beautiful, actually, statement there buried in the second article of the Mennonite Confession of Faith. Uh, and, and so how does this work? Now, and this is where we want to kind of pick up a little bit. And I said I wanted to put legs under this because my problem is my wife tells me this. A lot of times I'm, I'm working at the theoretical, you know, and, and, and my, the stuff has to grow legs or it doesn't do much good. So I'm going to try to give it some legs, this idea. How does this work? Well, uh, and hopefully you can see, um, I know my writing on this is pretty small, but how does uh, Christocentrism, how could you apply it? Um, in real life? Well, I think the way I apply this as I look at a doctrine, as I look at scripture, is I put any doctrine, anything, any teaching, and I run it through the, what I would call the Jesus test. In other words, does this idea that's coming out line up with the teachings and example of Jesus Christ? Right? Okay, say that again. Give it, uh, this is the Jesus. Here, I'll, I'll tell you just a, a practical example. Let's say that you're here in, in, in Lowville uh, and you have a real bad snowstorm. I know that hardly ever happens here, but let's say it does, okay? And the electricity goes out. And it goes out for a day and a half, all right? Then it comes back on again. And so you approach your refrigerator after the electricity has been off for a day and a half. And you approach that refrigerator and everything in that refrigerator is suspect. So you're going to take it out and you're probably going to sniff it, you know, and maybe look at it, see if it's a little green and is it supposed to be green. You know, if it's celery, that's okay. If it's meat and it's starting to turn green, you may have some questions, right? You may, you may sniff it for a rotten smell or something. You're, you're giving it kind of a test before you eat it, before you take it in. You're putting it through a little bit of a test. Th this is kind of what I mean by the, uh, uh, the Jesus test. Um, uh, Dwight Moody, uh, the famous evangelist, uh, said this. Would you put this quote up? I don't have it right in front of me here. It says, how do you tell if a stick is crooked? Well, you lay it down next to one that you know is straight. Um, in, in, in understanding scripture through Christ, we know that Jesus is God incarnate. He is God as God wants to know. God in the flesh. God sent himself down to this earth so that we can see him in a way that we can understand him. Does that make sense? He's the, he's the center, he's the fullness of God's revelation of himself to us. And so we have Christ, and how do you know if a doctrine is straight? We lay that doctrine alongside of the teachings and example of Jesus. You know as well as I do that people come to all kinds of crazy conclusions through biblical proof texting. You can prove all kinds of stuff through the Bible, and uh, and and there has been, you know, there has been just this wide range of doctrines and ideas that come out of people who are picking up scripture and are are coming to conclusions out of it. And 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 what we say is, well, we start with Jesus, so we're going to lay any doctrine alongside of the teachings and example of Jesus, and and we're going to see where whether that doctrine holds up or not. And if that doctrine doesn't hold up to the teachings and example of Christ, we do not question the teachings and example of Christ. We question the doctrine. Or we question our, more, more importantly, we question our conclusions. Because the, the Bible is not going to um, counter, it's, it's not going to teach against itself. The apostles are not, I will say this very clearly, the apostles are not going to teach counter to what their master wanted them to say. Paul 
Peter, James, any of the apostles writing in the scripture are going to write in such a way that they are building upon what Jesus, what Jesus wanted, what Jesus, the foundation Jesus laid. That's the foundation that we build upon. Uh, Jesus said to his apostles that the Spirit would come and would teach them things. You remember this passage, and teach them things that they don't yet know, that, he, that Jesus hadn't had time to teach them. So the, the Spirit has come. The Spirit came. The, 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 the apostles, uh, we believe, spoke and wrote under inspiration of this spirit, but they did not counter the teachings of Christ so, and the example of Christ. So when we get to the apostles, any kind of conclusion that seems to counter the teachings of Jesus is, a, is an interpretive um, error, perhaps. You know, does that make sense to you? So that's how the Jesus test works. Let's, uh, let's do this. How does, how does Christocentrism work in real life? It's the Jesus test. Um, let me ask you a question. What are, um, let's start with, 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 with the doctrines that come out of the teachings of Christ. Here in the Anabaptist uh, faith community, there are some things that we talk about, some doctrines. I'm sorry if that's really small to read. We, we have some doctrines that we talk about, some things that we talk about that come right out of the teachings of Jesus. Can some of you just give me, give me a popcorn here. Tell me some things that come right out of the teachings uh, of Christ that are doctrines that are just kind of core to who we, who we are. Themes that, that we, we follow that come, come from Christ. Yeah, enemy love, just right from the heart of, of Jesus, turning the other cheek, praying for those who persecute you, that type of thing. What else? Oh, very good. Yes, ministry to the least of these. This, this, this motivation to care for uh, you know, the, the prisoner, care for the widow, care for the orphan, care for the, those... Uh, in need, those, those that are forgotten by society. It comes right from the teachings of Jesus. What else? Something else that comes right out of... Speaking the truth. All right, speaking the truth. And, and, and the apostles would say, it's, and doing it in love. You know, that, uh, that's right. Even the truth to authority. Even the truth to, to, to those in, in power who Jesus sometimes had some pretty harsh words for. Anything else? Another theme. Oh, that's a good, okay, I heard two of them here. Uh, servanthood, yes. Yeah, the, or, or be the great, the, 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 yeah, the upside down kingdom as, as, uh, as uh, Donald Crable called it years ago. The, 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 this idea of servanthood. Um, well, last night we talked about this idea of Galassenheit, surrenderedness, uh, giving ourself to the work of, of, of Christ and, and, and to the church. You know, there's one over here somewhere. Yes, turning the other cheek, a non-resistance we call that. Don't, don't you know, overcome evil with evil, overcoming evil with good. The, the apostles echoed that later on uh, as well. So these are some themes. I had a couple of them here too. Two kingdom, uh, two kingdom theology is one uh, that I thought of. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that there's the kingdoms of the world. That's, this is huge. Jesus talked again and again about the kingdom of God. And so in an Anabaptist context, you ought to hear an awful lot about the kingdom of God because Jesus framed the kingdom of the God, God the kingdoms of this world, the, the separation between those two kingdoms, to, to between the, the, uh, the, the uh, upside-down kingdom of Christ that, that's, that's breaking in, that's, uh, that's changing lives and hearts, and, and the, uh, the, the power-hungry uh, exploitive uh, kingdoms of this world that, that are in, in a, on a separate plane. Two kingdom theology, non-resistance, I thought of, we talked about that, servanthood and suffering. Suffering's one that comes through the teachings of Jesus. Uh, echoed again by the apostles, by Peter, in, in the book of Peter. Uh, uh, suffering, uh, the sacred value of each life comes through uh, uh, Jesus taking time to pick up uh, the, the, the children and put them, put them on his knee and to say that unless you become like one of these, uh, you know, you don't, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Just the, the fact that Jesus cared for the, the sick, the lame, the blind, the lepers, you know, uh, this, uh, this, this sacred value of life came out of, uh, came out of the teachings of Jesus. So these themes should flow into us, should flow into our churches, and these themes should, should flow from us and from Jesus into the way we understand the rest of Scripture. Uh, but then there are some, um, 
some ideas that don't pass the Jesus test, some theologies or, or doctrines out there that, that don't pass the Jesus test. Can anybody think of a doctrine that's pretty common in, in, in some Christian circles or some places out there that just don't, don't pass the Jesus test? Yeah, a, a prosperity gospel, you know. Do you understand, the prosperity gospel is taught in some pulpits. It is this, this idea that if you become a follower of Jesus, you are going to have life and have it more abundantly, and that abundance will be financial abundance. That will be, uh, be wealth, and, and in fact, you're to, to live in such a way with such faith that, that God can bless you with wealth. And usually that prosperity gospel is attached to the idea that if you put some money into this offering place, God is going to duplicate and triplicate and multiply that money and the blessing is going to come right back on you. It's a great fundraising scheme, I will say this. And this prosperity gospel is this idea that being a Christian is a, is a ticket to, to, to wealth. And, and, uh, and uh, so does that pass the Jesus test? It doesn't. Jesus uh, taught um, uh, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He said that the, the, the foxes have the dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He challenged the rich young ruler, right, to, to, to give away what he had to the poor and come follow me. I mean, he, Jesus, uh, the, the, the prosperity gospel doesn't pass the Jesus test. Another, another doctrine out there that doesn't, doesn't pass the Jesus test. Anybody? I got a couple in mind. How about, um, well, I would, I would say uh, uh, um, uh, the Christian nationalism, maybe, or, or, or American, uh, uh, American exceptionalism, this idea that that, that our government is, is, is special and, and that it's God-ordained and, and that, that uh, the government of the United States is, is, or is ordained to carry out the will of God, much like the, uh, the Old Testament uh, Israelites were ordained to carry out the will of God. And then you look, at the, you look at the teachings of Jesus and you look at the example of Jesus and you can see that Jesus did not advance his kingdom through Coercion, right? Through military means or power. When he was uh, entering the um, uh, entering uh, uh, Jerusalem at the triumphal entry, the crowds gathered, singing, singing, "Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord." But it's pretty apparent that they were thinking they were going to have a political Messiah that was kind of come in and rattle the cage of the Roman Empire and turn things upside down and maybe uh, bring Israel back to its. Uh, glory of uh, glory days of David and, and Solomon, but but Jesus was coming in to to usher in a kingdom that was a spiritual kingdom, that was a kingdom that was within, a kingdom of God that was an, a, a kingdom that was not uh, advanced through coercion. Uh, when Pilate challenged Jesus um, to uh, you know, are you a king? And 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 uh, Jesus his answer to Pilate was. Uh, you know, if 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 uh, I was your your kind of king, my my followers would fight. You know, but they're not uh, be, because the kingdom of God is within. It's uh, so so that one doesn't uh, pass the Jesus test. Um, military service, uh, I don't. And I know I'm in a I'm in a, a a town here that's not far from a kind of a center of military service up the road a little bit from us. But military service doesn't pass the Jesus test, not as far as I can read. It's how do you turn the other cheek? How do you pray for those who persecute you? How do you love your enemy and at the same time kill them and, and war against them? And, and uh, you know, so, so there's, a, there's one that doesn't pass the Jesus test. And we, so we start with Jesus and we test every doctrine against, um, against the teachings and example of Jesus. And if the conclusion counters Jesus, then we go back and revisit that document and say, okay, what's going on? What am I not getting here? Does that make sense? That's how the Jesus test uh, works. Um, let's, let's wrap up here. Are there any, uh, that's the way Christocentrism works. I'm going to move on to the second leg of the stool, but I, this is what I didn't get to yesterday because I told too many stories about getting tickets. and you know, But i try to keep moving tonight to stay on target. But any thoughts or comments as you've been chewing on this Christocentrism idea here? 
before we move on. And I will say, for those of you who weren't here last night, I, I have a, a, a busy left hand here. I, I have, um, was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease about a year ago, and it has created a tremor in my left hand. Um, the, the, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing sometimes here. So, uh, but anyway, I, I just want to mention that just so you weren't distracted by it. And then I won't be distracted by it, but anyway. Uh, any thoughts or comments before we move on? Is it making sense so far? If you've been an Anabaptist a good part of your life, it should make sense. Um, I, my, one of my thoughts, though, is we don't always know, as Anabaptist folks, where our doctrine comes from. You know, we, we have this package of peculiar things that we believe, and, and, and maybe we get challenged on from our neighbors, you know, in the, in the evangelical churches or the Catholic churches or the Lutheran churches or whatever. And, uh, and why do you believe that? And, it, and it, 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 it's not that I don't believe that we're just cherry picking certain things, but if you start with the teachings and example of Jesus, you end up not swearing oaths. You, know, you, know, you, end, up, uh, you end up letting your yes be yes and your, your no be no. You, you end up turning the other cheek. You, you end up um, living simply. You, know, you end up, um, well, any, any manner of things that comes out of the teachings. of You end up separated from the coercive power of the state. You know, these are, these are things that come right out of who Jesus is and the example of Jesus. So that's the first leg of this three-legged stool that is the Anabaptist hermeneutic. I, I talked a little bit last night about what drew our family to Anabaptism. I'm not sure many of you were drawn to Anabaptism by birth. You were born into a Mennonite uh, Anabaptist family, and uh, you, at some point along the way, had the choice whether this was going to be your family of faith or not, and most of you chose to stay. Uh, some of you, maybe like me and, and like my wife Wendy, you have come in from, an, from other traditions. I came out of the evangelical Calvinist uh, background into Anabaptism, and I was drawn in. I shared this last night. I was drawn in uh, uh, by, um, by what I saw within Anabaptism, uh, and, and I grew pretty early on to call it faith with shoe leather. I saw these people living differently than the dominant society. And that wasn't the case with the churches that we grew up in. And, and, and as young people in our 20s, Wendy and I were both perplexed by the fact that if following Jesus is something we we're called to do, this, this radical uh, decision that was supposed to be a conversion, right? A metanoia is the, is the, is the, the Greek word for it. A, 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 just that, a metanoia is what happens to a butterfly when it goes in as a caterpillar and comes out with wings. You know, it's a change. Uh, why don't we see a change? Why isn't there some space between the followers, the, the Christians, and the dominant culture? You know, at least we didn't see it all that much. We, we both were part of faith communities that had high... Uh, doctrinal standards, lots of beliefs. We could talk to you about beliefs, about theology, about who Jesus is, what he did, uh, uh, you know, that type of thing. But in terms of how life was lived out, we just, as both young people, looking for what I would say is authentic Christianity, we didn't see any space between the churches that we grew up in, or not much. I mean, there, you know, a little bit. I mean, we didn't, you know, we weren't cursing at home or you know, we didn't smoke, or we didn't chew, or we didn't go with the girls that do, or, you know, that, whatever the saying is. But anyway, it was, uh, it, it, for us, but, but, but it, wasn't, it wasn't a whole lot of space between the dominant culture. And we knew that the dominant culture in America didn't come from God. It, it maybe had Judeo-Christian, a Judeo-Christian overlay. You know, there, there was kind of some source stuff within America that, that comes out of maybe the Ten Commandments, that type of thing. But... Uh, but we knew that it was mainly a, a, a materialistic, uh, self-serving, hedonistic uh, culture, you know, and, and it, it is to this day. And why wasn't there some space between our church and authentic Christianity? And, you know, it, it feels like being a follower, Jesus needed to lead to something else. And then we were drawn to Anabaptism because we saw in Anabaptism things like community, you know, people sharing deeply, living their lives together, carrying each other's burdens. We saw um, simplicity people living life uh, differently from the way they dress to, the, to how they live, to how they spent their money, to where they put their time. We saw people uh, uh, living non-conformed lives that were not conformed to the dominant culture around us, but were uh, 
you know, some of them were, were dressing plainly. Some of them were, uh, were making choices in careers and education and life that were just different than, than those around. And we saw these people practicing non-resistance, uh, uh, saying no to violence, saying no to the coercive power of the state. And, and that drew us in. It was, and I came to call it faith uh, with shoe leather, you know, this, this faith that actually resulted in something. And I, I thought a lot about it. Um, and and, and we were, so we were drawn in by this act of faith, this faith with shoe leather. And, and this faith with shoe leather, I didn't know it at the time, but I was kind of trying to think, where does this come from? I know they're doing it, but what motive? Why does this group, this Anabaptist group, doing these things? And, and just about everybody else that we knew in Christianity weren't doing that. And uh, after a while, I started to learn what was behind it. And this is where I come to this hermeneutic idea. We've been, we've been kind of wrestling with this our whole life. And eventually the light bulb went on. I had a friend who was also a seeker. His name was Wayne Chesley. He passed away recently. And Wayne Chesley was a seeker. He came to Anabaptism the same way. He was kind of drawn into Anabaptism because of what it represented, because of some of these lifestyle things. He used to say, Anabaptism, come for the lifestyle, stay for the theology. You know. It, uh, He's kind of like, kind of like me. Over time, you know, we, we would discuss what's behind this, and uh, and we we also came to realize that not everybody, even on the inside, knew what was behind it. And and one of the things that we found was um, was this idea of um, Christocentrism, and and we learned pretty soon that there was more to that hermeneutic than just Christocentrism. There was this idea of faith uh, with shoe leather. Um, Wayne used to say this. He, Wayne, Wayne was a very insightful guy, and he, he would talk about um, noun doctrines and verb doctrines. And I, wanna, I wrote something down about this a number of years ago. Wayne passed away recently, but I was thinking about this just the other day. And, and, and uh, I have a great friend from the great state of Maine uh, whose name is, uh, who explains this idea in terms of what he calls noun doctrines and verb doctrines. Noun doctrines, he said, are beliefs that are descriptive in nature. Uh, they may perhaps be foundational to our understanding of who God is or how the world was created or how it will end, but they don't necessarily call us to action. Verb doctrines, on the other hand, are prescriptive and challenge us to walk in the way of Christ. The Christian faith, of course, consists of both noun doctrines and verb doctrines. In many ways, the noun doctrines are more popular within Christendom and are easier to claim and to hold because they, all they require is intellectual assent, or at least an affirmation of faith. In fact, in many circles, there seems to be an inordinate amount of energy and sometimes strife focused almost exclusively on noun doctrines. Now, I'm all for seeking biblical truth, but one wonders how the witness of the church would be different if even a portion of the time an effort and emotional energy that has been focused on when is the Lord returning or whether or not the universe is 6,000 years old or if God has pre-selected each of his followers or, or whether King James was the only one ordained to translate the Bible into English would instead have been focused on simply putting the teachings of Jesus into practice. When we Christians get out of balance concentrating on the noun doctrines, especially to the detriment of the verb doctrines, we end up with a Christianity of the mind, a faith that can be explained intellectually, debated vigorously, perhaps even confessed, but yet a faith that has neither the qualities of salt nor light. If you wonder what Jesus thinks about this type of faith, just ask the goats. The difference between the sheep and the goats in Jesus' parable of Matthew 25, had little to do with belief, since both the sheep and the goats alike confessed Jesus as Lord. No, the difference was found in how each particular species lived out the guiding principles of Jesus' kingdom. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. While some of the noun doctrines are certainly important in laying the often unseen foundation of our faith, our Christianity needs to find its expression in verb doctrines. It's in the verb doctrines that the poor are fed, that the naked are clothed, that the cheek is turned, the extra mile is walked, the good news is preached. 
It's in the verb doctrines that call us to meet together with glad and sincere hearts, to enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, to confess our sins one to another, to forgive 70 times 7, to flee from the lusts of the flesh. It's in the verb doctrines that love takes flight for our neighbor, for our enemy, for the brotherhood of believers, for the Lord our God. It's in the verb doctrines that through the power of the Spirit, our lives are transformed into the image and likeness of Christ for the glory of God the Father. And so this journey for us from evangelicalism to Anabaptism was a journey from what I would call orthodoxy, or lots of, ortho, ortho, lots of, lots of orthodoxy means what? Right doctrine, right? To orthopraxy, which means right practice, that, that, that we moved into a faith tradition that had a premium on putting faith into practice. Why are we trying to earn our salvation? I don't think... From my perspective, uh, as an Anabaptist, I'm trying to earn my salvation. I can't earn my salvation. I blew that a long time ago, that possibility of coming to a holy God and being good enough or, or, or earning that salvation. But I certainly do want to live out a life of obedience and love to my blessed, dear Savior Jesus, who with his blood saved me from eternal separation from God. And, um, and, and in this uh, faith tradition, because we're Christocentric, we have a focus on a faith in action. I think, brothers and sisters, our Christocentrism, the first leg of, the, of this stool, gets us to the second leg of the stool because faith in action comes right out of the teachings and example of Jesus. And, and I think sometimes in some of the other Christian traditions, uh, it is a tradition that is, um, that is missing. What's the next slide, Mallory? I don't even remember. Oh, so, <laughs> so, so what we said yesterday was the three steps of the Anabaptist hermeneutic came out of three questions that these young Anabaptists were asking when they, when they first started uh, radically following Jesus. The first one is, what if Jesus is who he says he is? And he says he is God in the flesh. And if he is God in the flesh, then we're going to understand that all creation, all scripture, all of life is centered on who Jesus is. That's Christocentrism. The second question is, what if he means what he says? And much of Christianity, I think, misses something. One of the famous uh, statements that you'll hear if you will go to a Catholic church or a Lutheran church or, or a lot of the high churches around, one of the famous statements that is used is, is called the Apostles' Creed. Are you familiar with the Apostles' Creed? It's kind of a neat doctrine. It goes way, it's a creed that goes way back maybe to, to the year 800. In fact, there's some indication that this creed may go back as far as only three, 400 years after Christ. And it is a confession of faith that a lot of churches um, uh, speak together. They, they, they say the Apostles' Creed. And I don't disagree with the Apostles' Creed, but, but listen to something interesting that happens to the Apostles' Creed. Now, why don't you pull that up there, Mallory? First of all, it says, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty Creator of heaven and earth. We can, we can uh, amen that belief. And then the second one is, I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was um, conceived by the Holy Spirit and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading that, born of the Virgin Mary. We're with Him right there, right? And then it goes on to say, well, let's skip that part. Then it's going to say He suffered and died under Pontius Pilate. Um, he was crucified and buried and... Uh, descended to hell is, is the way that goes. And then it goes on to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And uh, anyway, there's more to it. But one of the things that's... Do you, you notice anything missing there? You want to back it up? Oh, we got... Uh, here, here we go. Uh, no problem. Okay. The thing that's missing in the Apostles' Creed is where's the life of Jesus, right? Where's the teachings of Jesus? It's almost like the church for many years kind of said Jesus was born... Jesus came to this earth, he was born of a Virgin Mary, and then he died, and he saved us from our sin, and made reconciliation with God possible, and now he sits at the right hand of the Father, and on we go, right? 
But much of the Christian church has just kind of missed or skipped over the life and teachings and centrality of what Jesus did during those, especially those three years of his ministry, during most of what is written in the Gospels. And it's, it's not a central part of, of the doctrine of the church, has not historically been. And, and the Anabaptists would look at that, and where all those question marks are up there, we would say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's, there's quite a bit in there that we skipped over here. Let's pay a little bit of attention to that. Does that make sense? And so the second leg of faith in action, uh, what if he's talking to us? The answer is this. The second leg is, as, uh, is, is faith in action. As Anabaptists, we are convinced that Christ means what he says when he challenges us to radical obedience. Jesus spent his ministry years on earth calling his followers not only to confess him as Savior, but to live out the rule of his transcendent kingdom of love. Faith finds life as it is lived out. And that's, uh, that's kind of central to what faith in action is. We, our first leg is when we read the scripture we're reading at Christocentrically. The second leg of the Anabaptist hermeneutic is we're looking for how it applies to us. How are we going to live this out? I don't know if you travel around a lot to churches, but a lot of times if you are in a non-Anabaptist church, you might get a good message on doctrine. I'm not saying this happens all the time, but uh, you might get a good message on doctrine, get some good foundational teachings on, on theology. Um, but one, time, one of the things that I notice is often missing is this application at the end. I don't know that I've ever been to a Mennonite church service where the the minister at the end is not leaned forward and says, so how are we going to live this thing out here? What is it that this is calling us to do? And that is a kind of, a, not that other churches don't do this, and I'm, I'm not trying to, I, I want to be careful here, and I'll say this, I'll probably say it a couple of times, I'm not trying to put us on a pedestal. I really believe in this hermeneutic. Uh, I'm, I'm with you, Evan, I think we got it right in this regard. Not thanks to ourselves, I thank God that we got it right, and I think it leads us to some things. Um, and there's a lot of good things happening in a lot of other churches. I'm not, so don't, don't take me that direction. But, but I do think that this application piece is so central uh, to who we are that it, it shows up here um, at, in, in how we interpret faith and how we go to the Bible. We're not just looking for the doctrine. We're looking for how to live this out. How, what is it calling us to do? Um, when, uh, when the sheep and the goats. I was, I grew up in the evangelical church. I had no idea the sheep and the goats parable was about uh, following and not following. I thought it was believe. I thought the sheep were the believers and the goats were the non-believers. It wasn't until I was in my 20s that I read that. It's like, wait a minute, they're, they're all saying, Lord, uh, <laughs> they're all calling Jesus Lord. The difference is, one group is doing something about it and the other one isn't. The other one that, that I uh, didn't realize was the wise and the foolish builder. I, I grew up in, in, in Sunday school singing, the, you know, the wise man built his house upon the rock. You know, you remember this? And the rain came tumbling down and the floods came up and the house on the rock stood firm. And then, uh, then there was the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And in my mind, growing up in the evangelical church, the wise man was the believer and the foolish man was the unbeliever. But is, is that what the Bible says there, actually? The difference between the two of them, if you look at that, let's go to that. That's in Matthew, uh, where is that, Matthew 25? No, it's Matthew 7, that's right, that's just right at the end of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. Matthew 7. There we go. This is right toward the end of the chapter there, is that right? 24. 24? Let's just do this real quick here. I think we, you know it, but uh, I'll, I'll do it anyway. Now, 24 says, Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man. Whoever hears these words of mine and does them. The difference between the wise and the foolish builder, the difference between the sheep and the goats, was not belief and unbelief. It was, it was doing and not doing, you know? And, and, and that's pretty powerful. And so that kind of perspective comes out of the teachings of Jesus 
and moves us to start to look for ways that we need to apply Scripture. And we even get to the apostles, right? And we start to kind of read the apostles and say, not, not what theology is Paul laying down here? You know, what's Peter trying to tell us doctrinally? But what's Peter trying to tell us about how we live our life? What's James saying about the rich people in church, you know, and, and about faith and, and works and, and, and how that all works together? And, you know, what, what are we being called to? How am I going to love my wife? How are we going to live as a family? How are we going to give? How are we going to practice uh, the ordinances of, of, of the Lord, you know, the, the, the Lord's Supper, foot washing? I mean, we're looking for practical ways to live this out because it's the second part of our hermeneutic. We're reading the Bible, looking for action. Other traditions are reading the Bible, looking for doctrine. I just tell you that as, as someone who's been on both sides. I, 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 I'm not going to paint with too broad a brush because the evangelicals also look for action and the Anabaptists also look for doctrine, right? We're both doing both of those, but it's a matter of emphasis, you know, or emphasis or whatever. Anyway, um, so, so why is this? So let's, I think, what's my next uh, slide there? Okay, I did that one. I don't have all this in front. Oh, why, why put faith in action, orthopraxy? Let's do this. We did this for Christocentrism, and I just wanted to take a moment to lay a biblical foundation for uh, faith in action, for orthopraxy. Remember, orthopraxy is right practice. Um, and the first one of those is because, what is the first one, Mallory? Would you do that? Uh, as an expression of our love for Jesus. As an expression of our love for Jesus. Would somebody read John 12, 20, uh, 26? Who would read 12, 26? Thank you. And who would read uh, or John 14, verse 15 and 23? Got that one. Okay, and Dave's going to bring around a microphone so the people listening at home can hear it too. So um, let's go with John 20, 12, 24. Who's got that one? That one's up, up here, I think. 24, 26. Or 26, I'm sorry. Yeah, that was my vision there. Just not quite doing it. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, then my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, me, him, my father will honor. Okay, so Jesus is saying, if, if you serve me, if you follow me, my father is going to honor you. The converse is, if you don't follow me, you know, not believe. Not, I mean, believe is important. Don't, don't get me wrong. Uh, the, you know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. That's, that's important. But Jesus is talking about following. What about those two verses in John 14? I think those are back behind you here a little, a little bit. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Oh, I'm sorry, I read the wrong one. That's 14. 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. And 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. So of those three verses, every one of them said, you're gonna, If you love me, you're going to follow me. If, if, if you're with me, you're going to do what I'm asking you. And two of those three verses said, and if you do, my father will love, will, will, you will have a relationship with my father. There's a reciprocal nature to that. When we follow the commands of Jesus, it brings us into closer fellowship with God, if that makes sense. So, so number one is that, uh, that we, we live out our faith as an expression of our love for Jesus. If we love Jesus, we're going to follow him. We get accused, I don't know if you know this or not, but we get accused of practicing a work salvation. Have you ever heard that from somebody outside of Anabaptism? Oh, you guys are just all about work salvation. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to earn, your, uh, earn your salvation. And, and you know, I say no, you, we're not earning. Our, our salvation is a gift of God, not by works, lest any of us would boast. But what am I going to do in response to that gift of God? That's the question. I'm going to do my best to do what Jesus is asking us to do. And he is certainly asking me to follow him. And if I follow him, if I love him, he said, my love is going to come out in, in, the, in my following him, in my following his commandments. The second reason uh, is that because, um, go ahead, Mallory. 
So that's what Jesus wants his disciples to do. Who would do that Matthew 18, verse uh, 18 to 20 there? So who'd read that? I think you know that one pretty well. But uh, well, no, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go through these, both of these. Both of these, in John 8, Jesus says, if you follow my teachings, you are my disciples. You hear that? There's a linkage there. If you follow my teaching, you're disciples. And then he goes on to say, and then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. I think that's an interesting verse. In some ways, Jesus is saying, start following me. Then you'll be my disciples. And when you're my disciples, the truth is going to come to you and it's going to set you free. Sometimes obedience precludes understanding. Sometimes we simply obey. We simply turn the other. I don't know if you've ever been in this circumstance where you will practice something that you've learned from, from Jesus. You've turned the other cheek. You've, you've, you've practiced non-resistance. And after the fact, you understand what it meant. You understand how it protected you. You understand God in the presence of that action. So sometimes, uh, sometimes truth comes as a result of obedience. Um, the other one there, uh, Matthew 18, is, or Matthew uh, 20, 28, is the Great Commission. Go into all the world. Right? And, and uh, make disciples, baptizing them, and, um, and doing what? Remember what the last part of that is? Teaching them, yeah, everything I've commanded you. Jesus, prior to, he said our job is to go and, you know, so I don't think Jesus would have left that middle part out of the Apostles' Creed. Because he's saying, go into all the world, make disciples. Well, that's the first part of the Apostles' Creed. And you'll be saved, you know, that's the last part. But but teaching them everything I have commanded you. I've been here for years. I've given you my teachings. I've told you how to live. I've told you what God wants you to be. I've called you to be an imitator of me. And, uh, and our job as missionaries for Christ, our job as going forward is to teach people to obey everything he's commanded. The third one, Mallory, would you read that one? Okay, and we talked about this, the wise and the foolish builder, the sheep and the goats. There is a, a difference, a spiritual difference, a practical difference between those who are faithful and those who are unfaithful. It's not that the faithful earn their salvation, but in terms of, um, maybe it's a proof thing, in terms of those who love Jesus, that love is going to manifest itself in faithfulness. So we're going to listen to what Jesus said, and we're going to say, oh, I love Jesus. I want to know what he wants me to do. I want to know how he wants me to live. I know it's maybe going to be hard. I might not even understand it. How does turning the other cheek advance the cause of good? I don't know, but I'm going to turn the other cheek anyway, and I'm going to trust that God knows what he's doing, you know, that, that that's the calling in my life. We don't have to necessarily... We, 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 Wendy's good at this. But we've raised children, um, uh, six of them, and one of the things she has taught them to do is... Um, uh, she'll ask them, you know, to, to do something. Daniel, you know, clean up your room. And, um, and he will sometimes, about once, look at her and say, why? <laughs> and, she, and she looks at him and she'll raise an eyebrow and he'll say, I will obey mommy, but why? <laughs> and, and, you know, the, the, it's just teaching them to put the cart and the horse in the right order. You know, the obedience comes first and then the understanding, you know, comes a little later. And she'll share with them why the room has to be cleaned because we can't walk in there or whatever it is. But, but, uh, but, but that obedience is so important. And this, is what, this is what Jesus is calling us to. He's calling us to obey. And, in fact, he's um, honoring those who obey. Um, and, uh, and that's important. Not that the, the, the obedient, again, I want to say this again, they're not earning salvation, but they are earning, uh, the, they're, they're earning the right to be called children of God. They're earning the relationship with Jesus. They're earning uh, the, the, the reciprocal relationship with the Father um, by, by their obedience. And the next one. Because it's what we are being equipped to do. What, let's read this one. First, First Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Who would read that one for us? Tim, thank you. And the last one is Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. Who's got that one? 4, 11, and 12. Do I have a reader? There we go, up front here. Okay, Tim uh, is going to read first, 2 Timothy, appropriate. It's your, it's your book. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, 
for correction, for training in righteousness. Let's, let's go on to the next verse. Yep. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Amen. So, so that's what the teaching, that's not, a, I, sometimes I've had discussions with my evangelical friend and they're saying, look, scripture is profitable for doctrine, you know, and, and, and I go on to say, yeah, but why is it that we are learning doctrine so that we are equipped to do every good work and what, what, what Christ is calling us to. And how about, uh, how about that uh, Ephesians passage there? I think that's up front here. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Did you hear that? So, so what is the job of, a, of an apostle and a pastor and a prophet? It's to prepare people for what? Works of service. We're being prepared to live it out. We're being prepared to, to do the work of Jesus. That's what we're not being prepared to, 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 to have a Christianity of, a mind, of the mind where we, we know everything and all the doctrines and we don't live them out. It doesn't change our life. It doesn't move us to action. And, and, and that bent toward faith with shoe leather comes right out of Anabaptist Christocentrism, and you see it at the very beginning. At the beginning, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the doctrines uh, that, that were in the place of the Reformation, uh, the radical Anabaptists, the radical reformers didn't disagree with, they just took it further. In 1527, uh, the very first confession of faith was the Schleitheim Confession. That's an all-action doctrine. We talk about the sword. We talk about the band. We talk about uh, uh, you know, how we relate to the, 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 uh, the drinking houses. We talk about faith lived out. It's a doctrine saying, okay, here's what we believe. Our doctrine, our statement of faith is here's how we live. And that is an Anabaptist um, that is an Anabaptist trait. It's part of our Anabaptist hermeneutic. We go to Christocentrism first, and then we go to Scripture, and we say, how do we live this out? Now, it does get us into trouble sometimes, because we care an awful lot about how we live this out. And sometimes we don't all agree on how that practice is lived out, but understand at least this much, if you are an Anabaptist, regardless of where you are on the spectrum, those two, those two hermeneutics are part of what's at play in your life. It's why you care about how life is lived out. It's why orthopraxy is something important to you. Um, it, it, if you want a little proof of this, think a little bit about why, um, why evangelical churches uh, separate and then think a little bit about why Anabaptist churches separate. Um, evangelical churches, if they'll have a split, sometimes it'll be over doctrine. You know, well, you, you believe in predestination and we, we, we believe in, in, in free will or, you know, that kind of thing will split it. Now, there's, there's bad reasons that any church splits, but, but oftentimes the doctrinal churches will split over doctrine, right? Uh, the inerrancy of scripture or not the inerrancy of scripture or whatever, whatever the doctrinal things are. The Anabaptist churches, why do we tend to split? We tend to split over practice, don't we? We tend to split over, over, over things that are lived out because we care so much about practice. That's what drives us. Uh, we're, we're driven to, to look for faith in action. It's a part of who we are. Uh, historically, you can see it in some of the early writings of Anabaptism. Menno Simons, I think I have a quote from him. Is that where we are, Mallory? Yeah, true evangelical faith. This is a, a, a famous quote of Menno Simons. It's some, put into a song. I've heard it sung before. True evangelical faith cannot lie dormant. Clothes the naked. It feeds the hungry. Comforts the sorrowful. It has become all things for all people. Um, Hans, De you know, um, Martin Luther had uh, his, his um, sola, sola scriptura, you know, scripture alone, sola fidel, faith alone, sola gracia, grace alone, the three solas of Martin Luther. Hans Denk, an early Anabaptist, some people called him the Anabaptist mystic anyway, he, he came and countered that by, by giving an Anabaptist statement. He said, no one can know Christ unless he follow him in life. A historian Harold Bender put it this way. He said, the great word of the reformers was faith. The great word of the Anabaptists was following. Um, Anabaptism is about Christocentrism. 
We start with Jesus Christ and we go to scripture through who Jesus is. That's how we come to many of the things that we come to. And secondly, because we go to Jesus, we prioritize faith in action, faith with shoe leather. We prioritize orthopraxis and we're, we're trying to live out a faith. And so we come to the Bible both looking to Jesus first and then we're saying when we open the Bible, how do we apply this? When we open the, the, the apostles, when we open the Old Testament, how does, what does this mean to the way I live? And that's the second leg of, um, of the Anabaptist hermeneutic. There's a third leg of the Anabaptist hermeneutic. I'm not going to tell you what it is. You have to show up tomorrow for that one. But uh, uh, we have actually five minutes left. So I've, I've, Mallory, I've caught up here. So it's pretty good. Uh, but I wanted to see if there's any responses, questions. Sometimes I, Wendy tells me this, I, I rattle along so quick and, and, and kind of don't miss a, miss a detail or a question. Or, or, or So is there anything that anybody is pondering here or is there anything is your heresy meter going off here and, and maybe you're a little concerned and need a clarification on something uh, that I can help you with or, or try to <laughs> anyone is this is this making sense so far mm -hmm. as, as as Anabaptist are you seeing it in your theology now maybe you're seeing it in hindsight you know when I finally figured this stuff out it was like, oh, that's why we do that. That's how that, you know, I kind of knew we had this package of things that weren't common. But when I started to discover this hermeneutic, and I did that, well, not by myself. I mean, I had a lot, of, a lot of help, a lot of reading some of these historians and theologians and people who've really dove in into the original writings of the Anabaptists in German. I don't read or speak German, you know, and gotten a lot of insight from them. But was this started to crystallize for me it all started to kind of come together. It, this, is, this is how we end up where we are. And it's a rather unique hermeneutic. It's why I came to the conclusion that Anabaptism isn't a denomination. It's not a culture. It's a, it's a hermeneutic it, um, with a lot of cultural stuff in it. Yeah, now, admittedly, it does have a lot of that. You know, we've got our Swiss German or our Alsatian France, uh, whatever stuff in there. But, uh, but at its core, it's a hermeneutic. Any, any questions here in the last... Two minutes and 32 seconds. Well, one more chance. Going once. There we go. Sold to the lady in the That's front. A woman. Yes. Jesus treated all women very equally with men. Yes. And I never liked Paul when he took it. Paul. <laughs> Paul writes in a, in, a, in, a, in a cultural context, but, but yeah, I think you have to understand that Paul still, he, he, and, and the entire Bible was written in a cultural context, you know, so we, we, when, uh, when Jesus talks about sandals and robes, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's not a call to, uh, to wear sandals and robes. But, but you can have a little more grace toward Paul when you understand that Paul was an apostle of Jesus, and if you love Jesus, then Paul's a brother. Paul's building upon the foundation of Jesus. Uh, Jesus' love for women, the fact that Jesus broke barriers in terms of the way he related to women, the way he cared for women, uh, uh, is, is a foundation that Paul would have known about and the apostles would have known about. It's an ethic that would have been a part, the par, part of the teachings of the apostle Paul. And so, so I think that tempers that a little bit, if that makes sense. But I, I, hear, what you're, I hear what you're saying. The, the other thing that I want to be careful of here in this hermeneutic uh, is Christocentrism. I was once asked by somebody, in fact, I'll ask the question and then I'll answer it. Um, Dan, do you mean that, that Jesus trumps Paul? Um, you know, a, a, as, if, as if Jesus says one thing and Paul says somebody had something else, so I'm going to go with Jesus and say, forget about what Paul's saying. And, and I said, no, I, I said, I, I, I absolutely don't think Jesus trumps Paul. I think what we have from the Apostle Paul is part of the canon of Scripture. I think it's been, it's been preserved. I think it's, it's, I believe in the inspiration of, of, of Scripture. I believe the Spirit inspired Paul to write what he wrote. But, um, but, but I, I, I say that Jesus frames Paul. So when I get to Paul, what, one of the ways this happens, for example... I'm going to talk now. I'll wait on this. But but uh, there's some passages of scripture where Paul says something. You can come to a conclusion and then and then backtrack to Jesus 
you know, and, and realize that maybe what Christ teaches helps us understand Paul in a little more fuller way. Does that make sense? So I don't believe that, I don't, I'm, not in, I'm not promoting, and I really don't want to promote setting Scripture against Scripture here, but I want to promote the idea that Jesus is Lord of Scripture, that every one of the apostles was committed to the teachings and example of Jesus like we are. Um, did they do it perfectly? No, they didn't do it perfectly. But, uh, but when they taught, they taught it under the inspiration, I believe, of the Spirit. They, they did what Jesus said the Spirit would do. And the Spirit's going to come and teach you things that I haven't had time to teach you. But it's all built on this foundation of Jesus. If nothing else, let that give you a little more grace toward, toward the, uh, the Apostle, who certainly was a little brusque sometimes in, uh, in how he uh, communicated. Yeah, Tim. Yes. That was not cultural. Yeah. That was very countercultural. Well, and, and sometimes you need to, yeah, it's very, very countercultural. Um, the, uh, sometimes we need to get to the deep truth that, that's there as well. And, and some of what Paul was dealing with per, perhaps was cultural, was immediately in front of you. But I, but I think I, I, I do that with Paul. I take Paul at face value and say, you know, but I, but I, always, I always read Paul with, with my Jesus glasses on, you know, if that, if that makes sense. Uh, and, and I think our tradition ha has. I'm, I'm not, this is not new stuff, I don't think. Historically, if you go back to early Anabaptism, you see that. And historically, if you go back to early Christianity, you're going to see this perspective. Uh, this was the hermeneutic. I made this case yesterday that Jesus and the apostles used when they were, uh, when they were relating to Scripture of their day, which was the Old Testament. Anyone else? We're, oh, we used up our two minutes and 33 seconds there. Well, thank you all for your patience. Thanks for coming. Come on back one more night, and we'll round out the three-legged stool, see if it balances for you. Uh, if you have any questions, you want to chew on this a little bit more, uh, you can do that. And tomorrow night, we're going to try to end, again, trying to put some legs on this. We'll, we'll apply this hermeneutic to a couple of puzzles in Scripture and see... Uh, see where we come out if that sounds good thank you thank you very much uh, any uh, final words here evan we do have a basket in the back put this on the tables in uh, you can put some money in that that would be helpful uh, to help you pay your time so probably tomorrow night we'll also take up the yeah. thank, thank you everyone thanks for coming thank you. yes and be careful on the way home lots of little people out there <laughs>